Good evening. We'll call the meeting to order. Thanks for uh, being patient as we get going here tonight. Um, Mr. Rembrandt, can we have a roll call, please? Mr. Gomes. Present. Mrs. Neary. Present. Mrs. Boatwright. Present. Mrs. Bolin. Here. Dr. Flowers. Present. Mr. Leary. Here. Ms. Sylvia. Here. Thank you. Um, we'll have Mrs. Bolin lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, we'll now do a moment of silence. We ask that you keep the following individuals who have passed away in your thoughts and prayers. Janet Perry, mother of Tracy Perry, Pell Para Educator. Maria Franco, aunt of Brian Ferreira, NACTEC carpentry teacher. Norman Coffey, uncle of Janice Massarelli, Pell Annex pre-K teacher. Clark Stair, grandfather of Caitlin White, Pell grade four teacher. Brian Anderson, uncle of Brooke Anderson, TMS special educator. Uh, Van Brockman, godson of Jennifer Robinson, TMS librarian. And Billy Rose, brother of Eddie Merritt, student attendance facilitator. Please keep them in your thoughts and we'll have a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Uh, we now have subcommittee appointments and motions in order to approve the subcommittee appointments as presented. So moved, Mr. Chair. Second. Motion made by Mrs. Sylvia, seconded by Dr. Flowers. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Leary. Um, I know this is for the public part of the subcommittee appointments, but can we go back and revisit our committee, um, subcommittee members from the school committee being on them? We, we have a next meeting. Can we somehow put that on there? There's some subcommittees that have been off that are missing. I have concerns with that have been deleted over the last few years. So you're asking to add that we, next meeting we have a report on our subcommittees? If we could meet together as a committee and discuss whether whether, whether it may be to discuss our, our own subcommittee appointments. There's two or three subcommittees. I have them all here for the last 10 years. They have changed, and I know things change. But um, I just think I'd like to discuss if you might have been deleted. Sure, we can arrange that meeting, Mr. Thank Larry. you very much. Any other discussion on the subcommittee appointments? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Next order is the uh, student council update. And Josephine Carwell Rednor is here to report on Give us a report on the monthly activities for the Rogers High School, Rogers High School Student Council. Yes, thank Those you, things? Mr. Gomes. Um, I am here to report on the most recent at Rogers High School. Um, uh, to begin with sports, our fellow senior, Izzy Booth, became the school's all-time leading scorer in girls basketball. Sport. <laughs> Um, uh, so, sort of hard to follow up on that. Um, <laughs> uh, sport, uh, spring sport registration has begun after a successful season, closing season over 2019, uh, winter season. Shout out to all of the seniors rounding the bend towards that last varsity letter. Uh, 
the most recent fundraisers. The junior and senior classes are co-hosting a blackout dance on Saturday. Proceeds will be going to both classes' proms. The class of 2021 is putting on a dodgeball fundraiser the 28th of February, which will be involving both students and faculty. The mock trial won their most recent trial and are already starting to prep for their next trial with great vigor. I know. <laughs> Senior project presentations are coming very soon and we are all hustling to get them done. Some notable projects are fundraising for the Potter League with our hat day and two students have managed a project to put inspirational quotes on all of the classroom doors at Rogers. It's a great way to spread Rogers pride. Rogers student body is getting so excited for the upcoming senior fundraiser, A Night to Remember. Someone else is here to present in greater detail, but I, all I have to say is that the senior class is indebted to Jen Carter and their dil diligent team for getting this all together. And that's all for right now. Thank you, Josephine. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for Josephine? Okay, thank you, Josephine. We'll move on now. Next order on the is resolutions and certificates of achievements, and we'll be presenting uh, recognition of the Aquinnick Island Land Trust and Christmas in Newport Art Award recipients. Uh, and we have six students. Six students from the Newport Public Schools have been awarded prizes in the Aquinnick Island Land Trust 2018 Art Contest. Aquinnick Island, Aquinnick Land Trust competition is in its fourth annual 2018-2019 16 on Center Art and Writing Contest, promoting the importance and value of healthy environment to the youth of Aquidneck Island. The contest was open to all Aquidneck Island students from kindergarten through grade 12, and where students were to create artwork representing their favorite island vistas. So we have some students, and I'll ask, uh, Ms. Neri to uh, present these as I, as I call your name, if you could come up to the dais or the podium over there, Ms. Neri will hand out the awards. So it's congratulations to our Pell Art students, their art teacher, Mrs. Sheen, and to the Pell administration. First, first place we have Leave Willie, first grade, Leave won $250 plus $500 for his Pell classroom to use for an environmental art class. Second place, we have Austin O'Brien from first grade. Austin won a $100 award. And in third place, we have William Kimes, first grade. Will won a $50 award. Those are our Pell winners. Let's give them another round of applause. And I just wanted to get the whole one school. So. Okay, guys. Thank you very much. You guys can go back. We just wanted to keep the Pell, the schools together. You guys can go ahead back where you were sitting. And thank you. And congratulations continuing to our Thompson students, their art teacher, Ms. Icott, and to the TMS administration. In first place, we have uh, Nichelle Collier, seventh grade. Nichelle won $250 plus a $500 for her Thompson Middle School art class to use for an environmental art project. Next, uh, second place, we had Giselle Ramos, fifth grade. Giselle, Giselle won $100 art award. And in third place, Tess Margolis, fifth grade. Tess, Tess won a $50 art award.
Thank you, girls. One big hand for the, the girls from Thompson. These students, along with their families, were honored on February 7th at the Atlantic Resort Newport with a fabulous banquet. In addition, their families received a one-year complimentary household membership to the Quidnick Island Land Trust. So good job, kids. The next is Christmas in Newport District Art recipient, and we have uh, Andrew Noves, third grader at Pell, won the best in show for his artwork at the Christmas in Newport District Art Show. Almost a picture. Okay, good job, Andy. Thank you. The, the district art show is held annually in December at the Newport Yacht Club, where over 250 pieces of artwork from grades kindergarten through 12th grade were juried by a prestigious panel of art judges. Upon receiving his best in show purple ribbon. His artwork will be located on every Christmas in Newport stamped envelope for the 2019 Christmas season. For the entire year, Andrew's artwork is now on display in the administrative offices of Superintendent Germain and Dr. Bean. Andrew's art teacher is Mrs. Sheehan, and his classroom teacher is Mrs. Bozvard? Bovert. I'm sorry. Last year at this time, Andrew was recognized for his heroic efforts receiving the Young Hero Award for, by the police and fire department. Andrew's talents are highly commendable in every aspect of his young life, and he's a premier example of making our Newport community proud. So once again, thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Next, we'll have the recognition of the science fair winners. Who would like to hand those up? We'll have Mrs. Sylvia hand those out as I call the students up. So the uh, following winners, the following students were the winners in their respective categories at the 2018-2019 Rogers High School Science Fair. As soon as Mrs. Sylvia is ready. So we have Gray Acock, the interaction of EMF. Same thing, if you all just, as you get your certificate, if you line up up there, you can get one big picture um, after we're done. Uh, Isaac Cardello, our basic dictionary attacks effective against randomly generated passwords. <laughs> Gabriella Cicerini, uh, which sports drinks has the most electrolytes? Uh, Alani Cooper, applying shoe insert technology to point shoes, pointy shoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 point shoes. <laughs> Abigail Mosier, hydroponics versus aquaponics. Emerald Lachlan Liquids versus Tooth Enamel. <laughs> Will Surth, the most effective bridge. And Michaela Ventura for Can Peppermint Improve Reaction Time? So those are the winners of the Science Fair category. Let's give them a big hand and we'll snap one more picture and thank them. Very good. Thanks very much, guys. Good job. Next up is the honorable mention category, and we have 
No, I'm going to call now. The other category. So the next category is the honorable mention category, and we have Emma Leach for Can You Really Taste the Rainbow? Uh, Jordan Minor for the antibacterial and antifungal properties of neem. <laughs> Michael Weaver for dying rock salt and its impact on ice melting. <laughs> we'll just continue into the engineering category is Lauren Maitland, uh, self-charging electric car. I may have said that. I think it's Laura Motlin, right? Motlin? Yeah, sorry. Laura Motlin. And Ella Walker for a baby safety wear. <laughs> so as they're taking their picture again, uh, it's, it's commendable to the staff at the science fair. As you can see, I have a hard enough time reading them, let alone doing the presentations on the topic. So. <laughs> They're very impressive, and uh, I know every year I'm impressed by the work that is done for the science fair. It's a great job, so thanks to our Rogers uh, science staff as well. Uh, the next item, I understand we are postponed to the March meeting. The History Day will be at a later date due to most, many of the students couldn't make tonight. And now we'll move into the recognition of the boys' indoor track and field Class C champions. So if we if we want, since there's a lot of names here, and I'm not sure who's here, we'll kind of. Bring the boys up and so that they can line up, if you will, boys, uh, over to the right by the camera along that wall, and I'll call your names. You're in alphabetical order if you can put yourselves in that, but I'll call you so that you can jump. But you'll, you're in alphabetical order as I'm going to call your name, and can there's quite a few of you. Can we get their coach to come up, too? Their coach, if he's here. The coach? I'm not sure if the coach, is the coach here? <coughs> Mr. Pauly can come up. So I'm going to... So, so, fellas, just if you can line up, fellas, follow Mr. Cawley along the back there, along the wall. If you line yourselves up in alphabetical order, that means you have to get up and follow Mr. Cawley. All right, so we'll start out with uh, Benjamin Adams, grade 10. So, Lucas Bonds, grade 10. James Barry, grade 9. James Barry. Louis Bettencourt. Sam Bond. Parker Brown. Isaiah Bryant. Arterio Canales, Graham Cloa, Sordi Coletto, Angela Curveis, Curveis, William Doherty, Joel Dupra, Ronald Edelin. Juan Pablo Fistopoulos. Franz Ellison Ellison. Jordan Tyrese Ellis. Will Foley. Will Foley. Andres Guzman. Parker Hagen. Ian Hall, yes, Ian. Ian. Yeah. Peter Hebda, no, no Hebda. Peter. Aaron Ingersoll, no. Colton Kenny, He's here. 
Ethan Kerlock. Kayon Lockhart, Kayvon Lockhart, I'm sorry, Kayvon Lockhart, Nicholas Lockhart, Damon Madison, Angel Martinez, Caden Medeiros, Ty Medeiros, uh, Isaac M Montanez, uh, Ezra Montero, Gail Rabbit. That's spelled wrong. Elias Morales. Louis Murphy. <coughs> Brian Neal. <Yeah>. Cordell O'Brien. <laughs> Lorenzo Olson Sherman. Yeah. Ozaris Para. Eldwin Peru, Michael Phelps, Logan Ratcliffe, Kyle Rodericks, Justin Rodriguez, Naquan Sampson, Eric Santos, Marvin Soria, Robert Stevens, Jonathan Tejada. Yeah. Okay. I can't, I'll call out the other names so they're recognized. Jaleel Thomas and Robert Zeller. Head coach is Andrew Matucci and the volunteer coaches, or volunteer coach was Jared Ombada. Yeah. Thank you, you guys had a great season. I enjoyed following you, you guys really were impressive. And again, uh, you represented Rogers well and you should all be proud of your accomplishments. Thank you, fellas. Good job. Give them another round of applause. It's a this this moves us into the presentation portion of the meeting. Our first presentation, Newport Community School, uh, has been asked to be continued to the March meeting, and that leads us into a presentation this evening by the Island Moving Company. And Ed uh, McPherson, Mr. McPherson is going to uh, present an update on Island Moving Company and the great things they're doing in our schools uh, in the past year and, and years to come, I hope. So, yeah. Mr. McPherson. Great, well, it's a Go pleasure see. to be here. Thanks so much. Yes. You're loud. As long as you speak, just speak loud so we hear. Okay, you want me to speak? No, you can speak in the microphone. Just okay. speak up. The as teenagers they... are making Gotcha. Yeah. Bless well, you. it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Edward McPherson. Uh, made a brief appearance last month and promised we would be back with a little bit more. Uh, so we're very excited uh, after having uh, provided some programs here at Pell in the gym uh, over the last month to do a report on our 2018 figures. Um, I, I first want to start with a little bit of thanks because we couldn't do this without uh, support from a lot of different people. Um, we receive funding for these projects from the Rhode Island State Council for the Arts, from local PTOs, um, from the school budgets, which we're grateful for, and from private donors uh, that make it all possible. So our thanks to everybody there. Um, you know, there's also another group that I think goes under-recognized. It's the teachers and it's the support staff and sometimes administrators too. And um, we wouldn't be here tonight, we wouldn't be in the schools throughout the school year if we didn't have support um, from the folks, the adults on campus that make it happen. So our thanks to everybody that plays a role, um, whether you're an elected official uh, or you're here day in and day out, we really appreciate that. And the parents too, you guys make it happen for us and we see that and we recognize it. Um, so there we go. So uh, I'm gonna go real quick and, um, and I'm gonna try not to mess up the technology. Uh, so I think just to frame this, we sometimes um, 
think that school is all about test scores, and it's a lot about test scores, but there's some other things. So it's worth taking a moment just to consider, uh, why do we need dance? Why is dance important? Um, I'm grateful to have a wonderful staff, so I'm going to read just a brief segment from a grant that was recently prepared. Improving student outcomes requires a community-wide focus on values and the practice of education. Acting on long-standing partnerships and strategic, strategic initiatives, IMC supports the work of Pell Elementary teachers by reaching every student in the first, second, and third grades each year. In conjunction with educators, IMC has developed and continues to refine its three core elementary programs, Math into Movement, Text into Movement, which is a focus on English studies, and Creative Movement. These programs use dance as a mechanism to reinforce core curriculum standards that the state has set for us. Um, the classes are taught, um, excuse me, so with the benefit of three years of observation through first, second, and third grade, we work with administrators and teachers here at Pell to refer incoming fourth grade students into the NAB New Dancer program. This is a program that takes place at 3 Charles on Washington Square, our off-site location. And what we found is that the biggest obstacle for many of the students from Pell to get to us is transportation. We're grateful that the school district works with us to bus students directly from Pell to, uh, to Washington Square. The program wouldn't be possible without that support. Um, the class is taught once a week by a working professional dancer. It follows a custom-built curriculum. It covers, of course, the uh, basics of ballet, but we also work with students uh, on transferable skills that they bring back into the classroom. We focus on dance, of course. It's a mechanism for the things that the school has already identified, test scores and absenteeism. I was thrilled to see today that Pell uh, is beating their average. We only had 10% of students absent, so great work, guys. We're happy to be here with you trying to bring exciting programming into the schools that encourages children to come to school. We know that kids can't learn if they're not in school, and we're really happy to be a part of that solution. Uh, a little bit of feedback that we received from a teacher. We try to be a learning institution, so we take very seriously the opportunities we get to hear from teachers, because they really can guide us as we think about how to support the work that um, everybody on campus is doing. So in 2018, we reached every first, second, and third grader on campus. I want to make a point to recognize the administrators in the school committee at Newport Public Schools. Um, this is the only district on the island where we reach every first, second, and third grader, and we appreciate that you make that time available for us. <laughs> a little more feedback from a teacher. And this is the time of year when we're taking surveys from teachers. And um, if you have questions, I'll be here. I'll stick around this evening. I've got business cards. Feel free to take a picture of the slide. Reach out to me. Um, you can really, frankly, reach out to anybody at Island Moving Company. We really pride ourselves um, on being good listeners and responding to community needs. Um, thanks for your time. Uh, thanks for the longstanding partnership. We're really excited for uh, everything to come. And uh, we know that it takes a community to focus on education and to deliver the outcomes we're looking for. And we're really happy to have a seat at that table. Hope you have a great rest of the evening. So I believe something's occurring behind me. And it has to do with island moving.
Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Timur Khan and I am a dancer teacher. Um, this particular program was literacy and we explored, our theme was hope. So hope is kind of an abstractive word and it's sometimes it's hard to show it through movement. And I thought it just will be really fun and cool to show it through the joy. So they had fun, this is the main thing. They enjoyed it, so thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ed, and uh, Isla Moon Company for all you're doing in the schools. And thanks, thanks for that demonstration tonight, guys. That was very good. Thanks, kids. So as we take a slight pause to uh, let them filter out after their performance, We'll move into public comment, and Mr. Rembrandt, has anybody signed up for public comment this evening? Yes, we have one speaker signed up. Okay, so who is? Beth Cullen. Beth, just when you get up, you know, just identify yourself, but we'll just give them a minute just to clear out a little bit. Oh, sure. Just 30 seconds or so, just to... Okay, so as we begin on that, public comment is a period when uh, members of the public can come up and make comments to the school committee. Uh, the time limit is three minutes, and um, you can speak on anything you like that is not on the agenda tonight. And if it is on the agenda, we ask you wait. But So public comment, and Beth, if you could identify yourself for the... Sure. Um, my name is Beth Cullen, 19 Bayside Avenue, Newport. And I'm here to talk about the uh, Sea Perch... Um, robotics competition issue that arose this month and I'm here to advocate for the kids that were told not to come tonight so I thought it's best that I say a few words about the background of the program. Um, sea Perch was started about 15 years ago at MIT and it was a program that came together to teach Boston area educators how to do hands-on um, STEM in their classrooms. It was successful, it was paid for by the Office of Naval Research and the MIT Sea Grant Office. A few years later, and this is important because we're trying very hard to teach our local um, students that there are so many opportunities in the marine trades. Um, a few years later, the Society for Naval Architects and Marine Engineers expanded the program, developing it into a national K-12 STEM outreach initiative. Students who participate in the program learn about robotics, of course, but also engineering, marine sciences, electronics, underwater cleanups, environmental sensing and data collection, video navigation, computer science and coding, as well as the crucial soft skills that are so important in today's workplace. Um, perseverance, camaraderie, collaboration, innovative problem solving, and how to communicate within a team and with the community at large. The, the Sea Perch model, uh, motto is teach, build, become. So I have a question, and I want the administration and the school committee to think about this as you're moving forward trying to solve the problem. I ask you, what are we teaching these students with this behavior that the coach just said, Oh, I'm sorry, I can't take this winning state champion to the national competition because I have a grievance with the union. The union is saying I can't go be a, t a coach for an after-school program that has nothing to do with his classroom uh, work. Are we teaching them that bullies win? And I think um, he's being a bully by saying I can't participate as a robotics coach because I have a grievance. My union bosses won't let me. Please teach them to rebuild with trust. How can they trust that adults here are going to support them as they move forward in their, in their endeavors? Fix the problem so, we continue, so they can continue to, on their path to become successful STEM engineers. And I say this because I know a few of the kids um, 
have been doing robotics since they were in middle school at All Saints and at Clooney. And it's really unfortunate. There's, they have lots of work to do between now and June at the Nationals. And they have no support. So I want the community to know, if this was a basketball team or a baseball team and they had won the state champions, would they be abandoned? I don't think so. Thanks. Thank you for your comments, Beth. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lynn Tungit, and I'd like to first off thank Josephine for mentioning the reason that I'm here to speak tonight about a night to remember, an event for Rogers and the NACTEC Center to help prom and um, many of the efforts at NECTEC. But I have to admit, I think the night to remember was actually tonight. This was, of all the school committee meetings I've been to, I think this was one of the best, you guys. <laughs> um, but anyway, just to let the school committee and other folks who are here tonight to give you a little bit more information about the uh, third time that this A Night to Remember event is going to be happening. Jen Carter and myself are organizing, hosting, if you will, this event. This year it will be at Rosecliff, but it is truly also really a night to remember to see so many of the Rogers High School students come together to work on this fundraiser for themselves. We'll have band members there to help provide the music entertainment. The culinary students will be preparing all the food and serving. And last year it was quite a treat for everybody that was there because everybody kept saying, oh, Blackstone is doing such a great job. But it wasn't Blackstone. Blackstone was really just there for the liquor licensing. <laughs> so um, that evening it's very much an adult event. There are adult beverages, if you will. So tickets include the cost of champagne, beer, and wine, and soft drinks for any, any youth that, that come. Um, in addition to that, the graphics department works hard on posters at the school and graphics for tickets and things like that. Um, the cosmetology department is very involved. They help um, put on the makeup and do the hair for many of the models who walk the runway. So they're they're a very vital part of the uh, part of the event, um, and it's why this year we have Jen and myself and others who are working on this feel very strongly about seeing some help go back to the NAC Tech Center. Um, it's, a, it's a lofty goal, but one that we think that we can achieve to raise eighteen to twenty thousand um, dollars that night for many of the different things that the NACTEC department has on their wish list. So it will be a, a fun night. Um, we have many of the shops in um, Newport who will be providing the clothing for runway models, who include many Rogers High School students. Um, girls and boys. We've had a couple of boys come to the model call. Um, Colleen Germain, our superintendent, is going to walk the runway again, and I believe Miss Ada Neary is going to, uh, to join. So, thank you. Um, there will be professional models also. They work with uh, Donahue Modeling Agency. Um, this year, one of our designers from New York, I believe, has asked that there be uh, creative movement and dancers. So Edward from the Island Moving Company, we're working with them to have a couple of the dancers involved also. So it's really quite a all-encompassing night for the kids. It's uh, one where the business community comes together. Many Rogers alums, um, Amanda and Brian Bryant from Newport Sweet Shop will be helping out. Dan Graves from Freeman and Graves, another Rogers alum will be participating. So this is really a night where the business community can come together, work with the kids, and help them all have a night to be proud of, uh, proud of also. And Stagecraft has been helping us also with lighting and sound and everything. Thanks for that reminder, Jen. So. 
Thank you. We hope many of the school committee members, people in the community can join us and there is a website. You can go to that. I left you a little save the date. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you. And that date is March 22nd. What's that, Moss? No, <laughs> now we're clear. Okay. Next, uh, next item is uh, item six is action items, and the first action item is six point one, a request for appointment of legal counsel, motion in order to approve the legal counsel as presented. So moved. Uh, motion made by Dr. Flowers. Is there a second, Mrs. Boatwright? Uh, any discussion on it? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, this next item, 6.2, will be moved to our March meeting, March 12th. Uh, there's some information that we're digesting on the lease arrangement, or lease agreement, uh, so that'll be held on our March 12th meeting. Uh, 6.3 is a request for approval of the TMS assistant principal contract. Is there a motion to uh, approve the contract? As presented. So moved. Motion made by Mrs. Sylvia. Second. Second. Dr. Flowers. Any discussion on the motion? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, may I speak, Mr. please? Mr. Leary. Uh, may I ask Mr. Galvin first? Are we allowed to discuss this right now, Mr. Galvin? Yes, I mean, yeah, if you have uh, a desire to discuss it in open session, you as a committee have the ability to do okay. so. So, my concerns, I'm sorry, my, my voice is gone too many years in the gin mills. Um, I'm concerned a few things that have been added to the contracts. Again, um, I have lots of contracts and ministries here over, over the years. And it seems like a couple of these things, in the past we would always discuss these things in a group, like a contract for a bus company or a contract for teachers, you know, whatever it may be. This is, yeah, you can't hear you, you can get personal. Oh, I'm sorry, there you go. my fault, I, my bad voice anyways. So I try not to talk too much. Um, so I have some concerns in this contract, and I've compared them to other ministers' contracts here. One is that we're allowing five days off to him to finish his master's in education administration program, besides the other 27 days he's entitled to. So it's an additional five days. Why can't that come out of his vacation time? That's number one. Um, a second concern is that we need to look at, I mean, I go back here, I mean, I got more than many, many years, but I, you go back here six, seven, eight, ten years, and it's still at 20% cost share for health care. That, I think, should be going up at this point with administrators, at least to 25%. You need to start somewhere with it. A third concern, um, when we pay these people out, and recently um, there's a vice principal at Thompson who just left, Mr. Campion, uh, went to another job, didn't retire, and we paid him a substantial amount of money out. So without tying the meeting up too long, um, or tying me up too long talking to you, is that there's, within 10 years they get paid a lot of money for leaving. So you work here for 10 years, and we give you a lot of money to go, and you go someplace else on your own. So that's a big concern to me. And the concern more important than that is that you acquire that money at one rate, and then 10 years later, that rate's much higher, and we pay you at that 10-year rate. There should be some type of measurement near. If you get the days when you start now, and 10 years later we're paying you at a higher rate, that doesn't seem fair to the public. And finally, um, I look at this thing um, that is evaluation. He's just been hired. And, and let, me, let me backtrack one second. I'm sorry. I'm talking way too much. Um, I have, this is not against the candidate. This is against the contract, okay? Um, the, secondly, in eight weeks, we're going to evaluate him by April 30th. So he's going to be here for two and a half months. He's getting an evaluation. And it's, is it good for one year, two years after that? It doesn't say. It doesn't seem like an appropriate time to be evaluating. So with all that said, I will not be supporting the contract. Is there any other discussion on the contract? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Okay. Mr. Mr. Chair? Yes. I just want to bring to the committee's attention 
that the contract has been posted for over 60 days and at any time if anyone ever has a question, please feel free to contact me, but it's been at least since December this, or January this contract's been posted. Thank you. Okay, uh, next item on the... 212, by the way, I have it here. So next item on the action items is 6.4, request for approval to issue an RFP for transportation. Uh, this is a, uh, a current contract for transportation will expire this year. This is the final year of it, and um, Mr. Leary has asked us to uh, put an RFP out to, for transportation services, and this is what this request is. Uh, any um, motion to uh, support putting an RFP out for transportation services? Yes, is in moved. order. Mr. Leary, is there a second? Second. Um, this is Sylvia. Uh, any discussion on the motion? No, I think it speaks for itself. Mr. I just thought the timing is very important. Um, it is. It is next meeting is April. Contracts up in June, so um, I don't want to wait through May or June to do this. We get them out now. Very good. Any other discussion? Um, yeah, Mrs. I'd, Neary. I just like to add <clears throat> that we may want to start thinking about different ways of providing transportation to our students that are not necessarily related to private bus companies. So that's all I want to say. And maybe we can get suggestions. Mrs. Pollan. I just have a question about capacity. Will, can we get help from the city? Will they help put this RFP out? Or do we have the capacity to get it out ourselves? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, they, they couldn't hear you. I said, do we have the capacity to put this RFP out ourselves, or do we get help from the city on this? The city helps us with all our RFPs, and they review them before we send them out. Okay. Any other questions or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next item on the uh, request uh, approval for a plan to address the lunch deficit. Um, is there a motion? Uh, well, we don't have a plan, but uh, we, uh, Mrs. Boland, I think, has some information. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Mrs. Boland um, for some discussion on this item. Okay. The lunch account is incredibly complicated, and it's also it's unbelievably sensitive. You've got to be incredibly careful when you make a move when it comes to feeding kids. Uh, our health and wellness adopted a policy uh, two years ago now that said that we would feed all kids, that we wouldn't do, a big word is lunch shaming, so that means that, that you give an alternative meal to kids that, that don't um, have, you know, are behind on their lunch payments. And so we decided as a group that that's not what we wanted to do, but what we wanted to do was put our efforts into making sure we collected all forms from students so that we could make sure that we were feeding all kids and A and B that the district was getting the reimbursement it needed. And so we, we established a, um, we called it a meals advocate. And we've been paying that person who um, actually is, is stationed here at, at Pell a very small sum of money. But just so you know, any student that we identify as being free and reduced brings into this district an extra $1,800 in extra state funds. So it's very, it's very important to get all those, that, those funds into the district to begin with, and that doesn't really have to do with the lunches. But it also is so that we don't run a negative lunch balance. Um, so right now, we implemented this person to help, but we've, there's a problem. It, we, it is such an overwhelming job to get forms back in that the recommendation of this committee is going to be that next year we have somebody from each of the schools to work to be in charge at that particular school of getting the forms back in. They know their kids, they know the families, it's easier to do. What, what we're down to right now, and, and um, basically uh, the, all the principals have been working with me and the superintendent on identifying exactly who's list, left on these lists. So we're down to basically at the elementary school maybe six forms that we need. At the middle school we're at 15 and just like you might expect at the high school we're still at uh, 44. You know, So it's, it's not good because we're running up debts every day with those students that we don't get these forms back in. We're working on a policy right now with um, 
with the policy subcommittee, I think they're putting us on an agenda to make to get this policy finished so that we maybe can have a little bit of strength when we go and say to the maybe the high school students, you can't play sports or you can't do extra activities if you don't have your forms turned in. You can't go to a school dance if you don't have them turned in because we have to hold something over them. Um, it's also um, interesting because you know, just this week when we got many back from the elementary school, what happens is they, they've incurred, incurred a debt, but then we declare them to be um, what we call um, eight, which means that they're now free lunch. So some of these kids have huge debts of a couple hundred, three hundred dollars. It's incurred from last year and from this year. And it's very difficult to go back and get that money from those students because, you know, it's like, I don't know, going to try to bleed, you know, get blood out of a rock. It, it's very hard. They, what we should have really done was put the, well, with parents should make sure they get the forms in A, but B, as a, as a school district, we have got to be more vigilant be, uh, right in October and November to get all these forms back in so that debts aren't incurred by students. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say we're really making progress through this list, and I, I give a weekly update to the principals on um, where we are with the list right now. But um, it's, it, you also need to know that we're at, uh, our debt right now is $50,000 from the two years. So, and that debt eventually, once that debt is not collectible, it, you have to declare it, it's gotta come out of your fund 10. It's gotta be declared bad debt and it's gotta come out of the general fund. So, um, my recommendation right now is we're working on the policy, the new policies, so that we can put some, you know, something behind getting these kids to turn in these forms. It's up to the school committee to decide if they want to not feed the high school students or middle school students, or um, they can also, get, by law, give them an alternative lunch if they choose so to, to do. But we, as a, our policy committee, um, health and wellness chose not to do that. So, um, and to go after, they're, they're at the end of this, like we're at the point where there probably are 10 accounts at the elementary school where parents just won't pay and they've already turned in their forms and they're refusing to pay. I don't know exactly what we do in those cases. So, you know, it's up to the school committee to come up with a policy on what they wanna do in cases where we've done everything we can to get the, you know, the forms back and the parents, you know, they don't turn them in or they, they did turn them in and they, they don't qualify. Thank you. So one of my, my motion this evening would be uh, in light of the $50,000 deficit, and I know Cranston has had some success lately, they hired a bill collector to uh, go out and physically get this to reduce their deficit to go in and get the money collected. So my, I would, t this evening I would propose that we put an RFP out uh, to have somebody come in as a debt collection agency uh, and at least look at the proposals for them to go out and collect the deficit that is approaching $50,000 at this point. So the mo I would make a motion to uh, put an RFP out for a debt collection agency. Can I make a uh, comment first? Sure. Um, I was wondering, uh, Mrs. Bolin, if at the high school, if we have engaged uh, peers, so the young voices, in uh, talking to their peers about the, the collection of those documents. Well, there's also, really important, there's confidentiality. You cannot identify children, you can't identify them to other people, you know, so you have to be very careful who the information goes out to. So. Um, but the coaches, you know, I, that's where we need the pressure put on. We, the, the high school's really got to step up right now. I know that um, our attendance, Eddie Merritt, has been helping, but next year we have to identify someone at each of these schools. I also heard that, that the debt collectors really don't want to do this because it is, it's a nasty business. It's, it's not good. We, we got to prevent it from happening. That's, that is where the key to this is, is prevention. Mr. Chairman. Dr. Flowers. Um, I mean, this, the, the amount that's owed is 
excessive is not the word. And I know beginning the policy committee, now that we have some of the uh, uh, community people approved, we're we getting that together. And perhaps we can be creative in solving this problem. Uh, Mrs. Bullen and I have discussed a few things. I want to know, because we're concerned about the fiscal status here, I'd like to know, and I guess you find out when you put an RFP out, that at least if it's, uh, it pays for itself, uh, that would be good, but we don't want to be spending more than we're going to be taking in. Um, again, as we say, confidentiality is important. Uh, we don't want to put any of the young people on you know, any kind of public shaming, that's for sure. Uh, if it turns out, you know, some of the youngsters are in a particular activity where a trusted adult who, you know, it, it keeps things confidential, but says, hey, you know, get this in, get this information in, and how we're going, it, it's really a conundrum, it really is, about getting the money from the, some way that people can pay back they owe a couple of hundred dollars, you know, gradually get it in something. I mean, we're trying to be fiscally responsible, and I think uh, um, if we can get that message through to the relatively few but still significant number of people who owe a great deal, say, hey, this is, you know, your responsibility to help the school system. You know, we shouldn't be in the, the food business, tell you the truth. This is my feeling. We shouldn't even have to be dealing with this. But we are, and that's the way it is. Uh, but again, we still don't want to lose the confidence of the people. Mrs. Bovary. Um I would like to suggest that, and again, on the Finance Review Committee, Becky is a member of that, and we've been trying to get written policies that haven't really been in existence for a lot of these mm. programs for income. For, there's a lot of forms that we have to get for federal reimbursement and for food reimbursement. I think we have to document those both for current budget and then for past budget. I would just recommend first looking at what we can do internally before we go to an RFP. Um, before, I would just suggest waiting until the next meeting to put out an RFP because I think that there are some real policy changes that could be made right here at the school um, which would uh, facilitate getting that done. A lot of the ones that are past tense, that's a problem, but certified, for certified letters could go to those places, but I don't know that you're going to have a good collection on past due. But we have to document all policies and be very creative in how we do collect debts ongoing and in October, September, October, November, December, which we have not been doing in the past. Well, I'm, I'm also working on forms that are very specific. So it'll say not just your child owes money, but your child, you know, submit your, or your family submitted a form on, and there'll be a blank with the date. And then it'll say, um, they were denied on this date. They are now incurring balances of this much, so that it's very specific to every family that they can go out. And also, I was I spoken to Nutri Kids about sending out more reminders, like you know, to be annoying actually, like like maybe daily reminders that you would get that said that you know your child running a you know a balance. So um, we're working with Nutri Kids on that right now. I, I think I would agree uh, in terms of waiting, but um, by the same token, the, the school year is going to come to an end in June. Um, and if we were to establish a new policy, and I'm learning these as I go, but if we were to establish a new policy, those take, I believe, three readings to get through. Two. Two? Two readings, and so we are looking at maybe another couple months in terms of not collecting, um, not collecting money that we are owed. So we just want to discuss that. By the same token, I do agree that um, an RFP immediately might not be the best thing. However, it is possible, as uh, Dr. Flowers said, 
that with new members coming in onto the wellness um, committee, that there might simply be a policy, um, there might simply be a solution that comes, that, um, that comes at us that we haven't thought about. Um, and, then, um, and then we could, we do not necessarily need a policy to implement it, but we could at least think about something new before we go into getting an RFP, because I'm concerned about, one, the RFP, the time it would take for us to get um, responses, the cost, once we hire an, an agency, there's certainly a cost to it, and again, is there cost-benefit analysis? And ultimately, uh, we, whether we like it or not, it is 2019, and we are in the business of feeding our children. Um, and we have to figure out a way to do that uh, both fiscally responsibly, but in a way that also really genuinely feeds them. So I, as I do almost at every meeting, I ask for the community to give us input, to think about solutions you've heard somewhere else, um, and just email us and let us know, oh, I've heard this place, it's worked somewhere else, this way of doing something. I mean, certainly Cranston, as indeed, um, have they have people going out and, you know, trying to get the debt. That's one way of doing it. Mr. Jim. Dr. Flowers. Just one more thing. Um, our argument, if you will, in my mind, is not with the students. It's with those who are responsible for paying, this, paying their bill. And should there be consequences for this for the students, I don't know. This is something I would have to really hash out with the group, you know, at, at, at a meeting where this is all we're talking about, uh, without attempting to be draconian, you know, and just saying, you know, suppose you have a preponderance of some of these, say, the kids at Rogers who happen to be on a, a team, let's put it that way, and all of a sudden you don't have these kids playing because mom or dad didn't pay for their lunch. You know, we, we, there's a certain sensitivity to this, in, in my mind. And also, we want to be fiscally responsible, too. So we'll have to, we can, I, I'll get the policy I don't think we would ever, ever withhold, you know, like feeding the kid or not letting them play because a parent didn't turn it in. Or we're talking about getting the, the form back from them. So if you yeah. get it back and they, and, uh, and most, in most circumstances, these kids qualify when you get them back. So um, it's just that we should have done it earlier in the year. Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman? Okay. Mr. Leary. I will be supporting this because an RFP does not cost any money. When you come back next month with the cost of the program, that's when you make a decision. So. Uh, Josephine, I think, has some input she'd like to add, so yeah. Josephine, go ahead. Um, well, because you kept on mentioning high school students, and I'm a high school student, so um, forms are a very tricky thing because, in my perspective, you throw it in your backpack and you never see it again. Mm -hmm. Lunch is a tricky thing because we have it every day, so it's not very special. It's not, it doesn't stand out. I mean, I, I probably have a debt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Guilty, no need. Um, so my idea is while, yes, we can, uh, and I'm obviously not very well versed in all of the policy making, but make it something special. Maybe, first of all, give them more time. Maybe send it to their houses before the school year even starts. Give them that extra boost. And then when they come into sc school, which is a very hectic time at the beginning of the year with scheduling and stuff, make a point to maybe set up a party or a, a field day and make people say, hey, if you turn in these forms that'll take you five seconds to sign and send in, then we can celebrate. I feel like if you were to make it something, I mean, I didn't even know anything about this until this school <coughs> committee meeting, and I doubt you'll get all of the high school students sitting in one of these, but, you know, make it into something bigger than just a lunch. And, maybe not throw numbers around, but make it into something that we know, like parties. Yeah, <laughs> yeah bribery. Yeah, bribery. So that's just, that's just an idea. I'm sure that it's, yeah. That's a good idea. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Josephine. That was a good idea. So there was no mo there was no second on my motion. Is This item is a request for a plan. Oh, you did? I didn't know there was a second. I'm sorry. I didn't hear the second. I didn't think there was a motion. So the motion is to hire, put an RFP out 
uh, to have a debt collector come in to recoup some of the uh, money that is outstanding on the lunch balances. Any other discussion? RFP for a debt collector. Right? RFP, right, correct. Right. Any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. 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 Okay, motion fails uh, five to two. Next item on the agenda is uh, tuition waiver 6.6. It's a tuition waiver request from Dr. Germain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, our policy, and give me a moment. My glasses went on me. 5120. Thank you. 5120 um, requires us, when and if a student wishes to remain in the district because of moving or anything like that, um, that a tuition be paid to the district for that. We have in some cases, and prior to this, in other places I've been, when those circumstances arise and a family comes forward and the child has been in the school system all along and because of family situations, have to move out of the city or town, usually the superintendent can say, sure, I usually talk to the building principal, et cetera, see if building principal, feedback, and then if everyone's in agreement, we waive a tuition or let the family finish the year with the understanding the children must be registered in the new hometown, whatever that new hometown is. Certainly if something happens right at the beginning of the year, in August, before school starts, always recommend and we always tell our families it's best to register in your hometown where you now live. But as I will share with you, we do have sometimes special circumstances, sometimes beyond the control of the family or because of financial situations, they're not able to stay within our city borders and they have to relocate. So I'm asking this evening to be able to waive the tuition in cases in which I have families and I'll always consult with the committee about this uh, if I have families that are requesting their children remain in the school system for the rest of the year. Rhode Island law does allow a student, whether first semester, if the child moves during first semester, that the child can stay automatically until second semester starts, and the same for second semester. If a child is in the middle of second semester or has started the second semester, the child may remain in the community until the end of that semester. I'm asking if a child is move, has moved in the first semester due to certain, certain circumstances to have permission to waive the tuition fee and allow the family to stay for consistency and for the children. Thank you. So I, I just have a question, Mr. Galvin, on that. I mean, would that not take a policy change because of, as I read the policy, I believe it requires the superintendent to ask approval to waive it of the school committee, correct? Yeah, I don't have that policy in front of me at the moment. If I could just take a peek. I would think you're right. It's the first line to change the policy. You, gotta... no, you can waive You can, you can waive the policy with two thirds majority. What, what is the timing of this, by the way, in terms of we're currently in the second semester right now? Right, and the family had requested to stay in the district. So in the I care. spoke with the family, and I thought it would be fine. I looked at the policy, and the family is still in our district, and I'm coming before the committee because a committee member asked that it be put on the agenda. Well, I mean, the, the current state of the law is, that as we sit here today, uh, in terms of the uh, tuition, the statute. Mr. Gell, can you, we, we can't, it's, thank you, just right. pull the mic forward. The current right. state of the law, as we sit here today, uh, the statute talks in terms of uh, being in the second semester, and uh, you cannot uh, force a parent to leave 
uh, during that time period if you're in the second semester. So as you sit here today, um, the statute 16-64-8 says, when a student changes his or her residence during the course of a semester, the student shall be allowed to complete the semester in his or her original city or town of residence. But, but what needs to be pointed out is that, I, I don't think we've made this clear, these kids were here, they asked for this waiver, they moved in September. No, I realize that. Yeah, and then oh, yeah. the end of the semester came, and then she, you granted it for the second semester. Right. And I will just say, as a military person, it's our kids, so it's also important to know that it's good to get kids situated in a new district before the summer happens because you want the kids to meet people. So there are two different theories of thought on that, you know, of, of moving the kids better in the middle of the semester, you know. So I'm just saying that it was. No, I realize that. Just, just for clarification, what I, I mean, it seems to me there's two things rolled up in here. There is the current situation in front of us for the tuition waiver for a current family in a situation. However, the action item says superintendent is requesting permission to waive tuition on a case-by-case -case basis. My question is we would have to amend the policy to grant that permission on a case-by-case -case basis. Or suspend the policy, as Mr. Leary Or suspend again. the policy, but we can only suspend the policy for this meeting this evening. Mm. Correct. Yeah, you so we would not be granting the superintendent permission on a case-by-case -case basis to waive the tuition. That would, that would right. You would, be, you would be suspending your policies in order to deal with a specific request before you, I, I, if you so chose. I do think once we left the kids here, we can't say to them now, they started the second semester, so, you know, they... they That's all I was pointing out. Yeah. Right. Once they started and we let them do it, you can't you can't basically now kick them out because they have started. But so, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mr. Leary, Leary, you said September. These kids moved in September. End of September. I think they bought. That's the, the first. September that's not even the first quarter. When did they move? Excuse me. I was informed. I believe in October, Maybe. October or November about this. So October still would be the first semester. A semester be half a year, which would be January. So the action, so I, what I would suggest this evening to move this action item along is that if it were the uh, will of the body, there would be a motion made to approve the superintendent's recommendation to waive the, uh, a waiver request for this particular incident. As far as the, the issue of giving the superintendent a case by case, I would suggest that we uh, send that question to the policy committee. But for this evening, I think a motion would be in order to waive, to recommend the superintendent's recommendation on this issue of a waiver for this particular family in this particular case. That would be the first order. The second order would be to send this issue to the policy committee for a recommendation on changing the policy if needed. So moved. So we Mr. need a motion Chair, on one of the two. I will move that we grant, authorize, the, um, allow the superintendent to waive the requirement and allow the student to complete the second semester. Students. These students in this particular family. This more than one. family. Yes, that is correct. Three. So there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. The motion's been made by Mrs. Sylvia, seconded by Mrs. Neary. The motion is to approve the superintendent's request for a waiver for this family in this particular incident, which I believe is three students? Correct. That would be the motion. Any discussion on the motion? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Leary. Could you ask Mr. Galvin if we have to amend our policy first before we vote this? Because the policy says... The, the way I'm interpreting the motion, Mr. Leary, is that is it's a uh, motion to suspend your suspend. current policy in order to allow this waiver of tuition. So, so it would be a suspension of the policy. Do you need two votes? I'm sorry? Do you need two votes? One to suspend the policy and one to vote on it? I think you could combine that into one motion. To suspend the policy. So I will amend the motion. I, I would ask Mr. Sylvia and I will amend, I will offer the motion would be, uh, the motion would be to suspend our policy 5120 and to allow the superintendent to waive the tuition for this particular family at this time uh, for the three students. Yes. The motion would be that. Mrs. Sylvia, would you agree to that? Yes. Yeah. Mrs. Sylvia, the motion has been amended. 
second. Mary has a second. Yes. So the motion is to suspend the policy and allow the, stu the superintendent's recommendation to allow the family the waiver for tuition. So, Mr. Chairman, one more time. Mr. Leary. So, uh, I hate to so we need a two-thirds majority vote, then, Mr. Galvin? I think you may. Thank you. Okay. To suspend. I would, have, I would have to double check it, but I know it's not a simple majority. I forget yes. the exact language, but I think Which that's would be it. What, fine? So, again, uh, any other questions on the motion? I just want to clarify. Mrs. Bobright. Thank you. Just want to clarify what's written in this document and for the public to see is that there's no additional cost for having these children in the school system, correct? Absolutely not. Right. So, thank you. Any other discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Do we have, do you have that, Mr. Member, the motion? Okay. What's the vote? Six to one? Six, Six to one. one. I, w I want to thank the committee very much, and I will inform the family. Thank you. Uh, I would also entertain a motion to, on the second part of this, that we would send uh, this policy to the policy committee for a recommendation on changes to it per the superintendent's recommendations. Is there a motion? So moved. So motion made by Mrs. Neary, seconded by Dr. Flowers. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. We move into discussion items. First item on discussion is 7.1, the NACTEC NEASC visiting team recommendations update. And Mr. Young is going to give us an update on the NEASC recommendations. Good evening, everyone. How are we doing? So I just want to say Carrie Clark was uh, supposed to be here tonight to help me, but we have a pretty big event at this high school right now for Prepare RI. We had about 125 families um, at that event, so that's where she is uh, tonight. So uh, another positive night um, for the Career Tech Center. So we sent you the presentation, what, a couple weeks ago, and I guess the intent is to send this out to kind of keep this um, kind of the flow moving here as opposed to going through all of, uh, 37 slides. So I do want to just kind of stick to some of the, some of the main points. Um, of the committee's recommendation. I think first and foremost, we really have to decide whether or not we're gonna do this again as a career and tech center, or if we're gonna go and do it with, uh, in conjunction with Rogers High School. So we do have you know, some time to, des to decide that, but um, the decision helps kind of guide where we're going as a career and tech center. So for example, some of the recommendations were in there were about the NAC Tech mission statement. So do we have our own mission statement or do we share and mirror you know, Rogers High School mission statement. So that's kind of stuff that we have to decide, you know, with the committee and, and uh, with the administration staff is, you know, where, where, where are we going with this? Because, um, again, you know, I think the mission statement kind of drives a lot what you do and everything that we do as a career tech center should support, you know, the mission statement. So we are, you know, kind of some kind of decisive. Well, I do understand 10 years is a long time and I don't know how many of us will be in these uh, same seats in 10 years, but at the same time, you know, those are some things that we do have to seriously um, consider uh, as we go forward. Just a couple of other highlights um, in, the, in that is, uh, you know, in the learning expectations as part of the mission statement, so those are the kind of things that we'll follow, whether or not we're doing the same with the, with the center or um, if we're moving on on our own. Um, one thing they did ask for is some type of form of assessment common to all students. And so we are piloting a program this year, it's called Precision Exams, and there's a, a bunch of exams in that program, and one of which is a 21st century um, assessment for students. So, you know, we did a pretest in, in September, October, and we'll do a post-test in April or May. What I like about that in, um, is that the students will get uh, the results from that, but it'll tell them and the teachers what 21st century skills they've mastered already, and they'll get a nice certificate. So we'll print up a certificate that'll go along with that, but it also has kind of a graph or a chart that helps fill in their resume. So when they go and apply for jobs over the summer and they hand you know, the traditional job application, along with that, they'll have that certificate that says, you know, student A has mastered oral communi communication, written communication, um, he's mastered some other 21st century skills. But then it allows us as a center to kind of guide, you know, how we know we're doing, uh, you know, the right thing, preparing our students, uh, you know, for the future. So that's one extremely positive, uh, you know, move forward that we, some of the advice we did take from the committee um, on that. We did uh, kind of partner with some other, with uh, Winsocket Career and Tech Center has the same program. So we talked to them about that before we decided to pilot that um, uh, this year. 
a lot of the curriculum that, that comes up in there, um, just so you know, the, the process for the curriculum in any CTE ride approved program is, is a statewide subcommittee. So each program is part of a, a subcommittee. So for example, you know, JROTC has one, Carpentry has one, they all have one. So they're the ones who kind of recommend the curriculum that we use and then they take that recommendation to the CTE statewide advisory board and they have to approve it. So if we did want to change anything in our curriculum, uh, we, did have, we would have to go through that process. So for example, our carpentry program, we're looking at another um, curriculum that is being recommended through RIDE. However, um, I do think we need a much, much, much better job in uh, showing our curriculum. And so one of the things that we want to do is have a standard format for each program so that if someone wants to come in and says, what are you teaching and when, we'll have a standard format for that. So that's one of the things that we are working on as a, as a team to have that standard format for, uh, to show people what our curriculum is. And then, you know, next step is we'll put that on the website um, and then we'll, you know, make it accessible uh, to everybody as opposed to asking and, and having five or six different kind of formats. Well, I do think that's a, a something that we definitely need to work on uh, for them. Again, the program of studies, um, you know, we put that in the Rogers High School program of studies. We are looking at putting that um, in some of the other sending district, uh, uh, their program of studies as well, just so those students know that, um, you know, the opportunities are there. Um, uh, we do have some CPT. I think with this new, you know, Mr. Vance's new schedule, it's going to give us the opportunity to have our teachers more time together. Um, PD is, I think, any school and any, anywhere you go is going to say, you know, more and, and better PD. So we are looking at ways to get our teachers with, you know, not just with the, the Rogers High School uh, PD program, but some like PD with, some, with their peers so they can kind of sit with, with uh, you know, fellow chefs or fellow carpentry folks and, and kind of share that with, uh, with them. Um, you know, the safety plan, I think, you know, I think we all know uh, the Career Tech Center. I mean, it's open. <laughs> There's no secret. I mean, there's a restaurant in there, we have a salon in there, we have a, uh, you know, an auto shop in there. So we've got to decide, uh, you know, are we going to make changes to that or are we just going to, you know, uh, you know, stay vigilant and do the best we can with, you know, that open, uh, you know, kind of building there. So uh, another one that they recommend, which is extremely difficult, and I've been in other districts where we've tried to do this, is, is the follow-up. You know, how do we know our students are getting jobs uh, in their field and do we know that? We have worked with RIDE on that, and they're looking at partnering with the Department of Labor and Training to see if our students are, are actually going into the workplace after um, they graduate. However, if they leave Rhode Island, there's no kind of reciprocal uh, agreement with Connecticut or Massachusetts. And I think, you know, we, we all know that a lot of our uh, young workforce is, uh, you know, leaving the state uh, for employment. So that, that, that's a difficult one. Um, but we are working with our peers and trying to kind of come up with a way because all the districts are struggling, uh, the CTE centers are struggling with how to how, you know, how do we track that um, with that. Um, another one they recommended was uh, you know adult education. We have kind of to, to talk about how you know if we open up our center at night or weekends and have opportunities for some type of adult education in there. We have uh, kind of just briefly talked about it, but uh, not really you know kind of targeted that uh, directly. Uh, some of the other things individually, uh, our AYT program, you know, we're in constant communication with the tech department and upgrading and, and maintaining the, the facilities in there. Um, and uh, we are, um, the teacher has just recommended, you know, some slight changes to make sure that that's staying relevant in the field. But again, you know, we get those recommendations through to industry, our industry partners there. Uh, auto, um, you know, there was some significant recommendations, but we have, do, I do have a new teacher in there who's been great and clearing some stuff out. We found manuals in there from, I think, from the, you know, the Model T Ford uh, vehicle in there, but he's, he's really changed that, upgraded it. He's a technology, you know, person, so, you know, that's come a long way, but I do want to stress to the committee that we do have to invest in the programs, okay? They are high, um, you know, expensive programs. It's not like I'm just buying a case of books or something small. I mean, we're looking at $18,000, $20,000, you know, pieces of equipment that are relevant um, to the field. So we just have to uh, you know, make sure that we're, we're aware of that and, you know, and we are putting together, you know, a five-year plan on what's going to be needed within uh, each particular program. Our ad design, um, I think we are at the point now where we really have to push getting students out of the building and into, uh, you know, outside placements, internships. Uh, if you don't know that 
this year's freshman class, they must have 80 hours of work-based learning experience uh, by the time they graduate. So, uh, you know, we have up until uh, they graduate uh, to get those 80 hours in there. Um, culinary, has, it's, you know, it, it's uh, you know, a fast-growing program. We're starting to get our, our, um, our uh, applications in. And again, culinary is, is the, the number one choice uh, throughout uh, the entire, all of our, our, our districts. So, um, again, we, we do have to uh, uh, decide which way we're going to go uh, in that program. And some of the other stuff was the facility piece. So our JROTC, their recommendations were, you know, upgrade the facility. Um, Auto was kind of, you know, check at the facility and things like that. But we are working, you know, collectively as a team to, to uh, address the issues. I think, you know, a lot of, there are a lot of positives. You know, we're definitely proud of, of maintaining our accreditation. And we, we welcome the, uh, uh, the, you know, the comments from the NEAS committee on that. And it's going to help us, uh, you, know, you know, go forward. We, we, we take it as, you know, an outside evaluator a person coming in and saying this is what we see you know what do you see this is what we see and then you know it helps us uh, move forward I think um, some other positives with going through the, the program is uh, we had two teachers that served on committees um, which is some excellent professional development going to another building and seeing how they work um, definitely helps them uh, I served on a committee uh, myself I'm now uh, certified or trained if you want to be a NEAS committee chair um, and so they've, they've asked me to attend training, you know, based on what they saw um, here in Newport. Um, Mr. Ferreira, our carpentry teacher, is, is getting uh, multiple emails about him going out and uh, being on committees as well. So uh, it just says a lot about, you know, what our teachers, uh, what they saw um, in our programs there. So definitely positive. So. Great. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Young? Mrs. Bolin. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking at the key tech. Pull that closer. Yeah. Yep. I'm Keep looking going. at PTEC, and um, I see that that uh, we have three grades, 9, 10, and 11. Correct. And we, went, we have 26, 20, uh, 27, 26, and 23 students. Yes. And I, that, they do that on the, um, what is that called, the summit, summit platform. Correct. Do, so when there's 27 students, do we have to have two freshman teachers teaching the English class? No. Some of the students are, not all the students are in every um, uh, Summit or PTEC uh, classroom. So some students, if they're in advanced math or in advanced English, we keep them in that. You know, if they're in, if they come in a, in ninth grade, they're in a traditional English program, then they're in the Summit program. But if they're in honors, then we, we keep them in the honors math or honors English or honors science piece. You do so we don't ever run. Over. I'm just worried about expanding a program so that it was costing us a great deal more just to have one or two extra kids. In no. It. So if we had extra seats in that in that classroom uh, we would we, we did fill it with um, NAC tech students so one of the intent or goals in that was to keep that student kind of in the building so they're not going you know all the way back you know one side of the campus to the next so they would they would have auto and go to uh, the summit English or the, the summit math uh, piece in there and I just wanted to make one other comment I'm, my son graduated with in the carpentry program and he's an accomplished carpenter it's not that he plans to go into carpentry, but for the rest of his life, it's going to provide an income for him because he wants to become a fireman. So it's not always like about evaluating that program by making sure the kids go into, you know, carpentry, but rather the experiences we give these kids, even if it's one or two years, you know, in culinary or whatever, it helps them to get through college or, you know, so I, just, I hope we just don't evaluate it through no, that it's, one you know, lens. It's problem solving. It's working as a team. It's it's finding a solution to something that you're working on, and it's it's a you know it's a pride thing. After you especially in carpentry, you leave at the end of the day with something that wasn't there, you know, or when you showed up. So, right. but I, and I also want to caution against. I don't think he would have ever been interested if it was an insular program. If everything would happened in that building, he liked being part of the bigger Rogers and and AP classes and and. Mm -hmm sports and, and everything. He wanted to be part of that. If it had been just in those classes had only been there, I think that it wouldn't have been as interesting. Um, um, uh, thank you. Um, first, I want to congratulate you on being the second one accredited in the state of Rhode Island. That's very impressive. I do want to ask you, how, how many of the students do you think would take advantage of an internship um, if you could offer it one or two days a week? Can you answer that? 
Yeah, I think, I mean, it's hard to say. We've offered some to some students already. Um, really, some of them don't want to leave the teacher. You know, like, I don't, there's students in auto. I'm like, why well, get an internship at a dealership? I'd rather stay here with, you know, Mr. D or something like that. So, I mean, it, it, but there are a lot of students who do want to get out into that workforce and actually, mm -hmm. you know, have that, that external ex external piece. One of the things that we're, we're kind of pushing for the internship is that, you know, we do have, um, you know, as we go one to one, and there we, we put together a help desk, which is run by you know our students in conjunction with our tech department. So they're getting some internship hours. They're just staying you know in the building. So we're we're also looking for other ways to get them you know those hours, whether or not whether they're working on you know NAD design assignment for you know for the the event in March, for example. If they're doing a certain amount of hours for that, we can count that towards those um, internship hours themselves. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, we just had a conversation with a, a student who's potentially a full-time student at CCRI next year, and one of the struggles they're having is that, you know, it's a single mom, so he's, he's really attached to, to one of the, the male teachers in our tech department, because he's doing, you know, an internship, mm -hmm. and um, our P-Tech math teacher. So he's struggling with, well, if I go to CCRI every day, I won't be able to see Mr. So-and-so. So, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's, it's hard to give an exact number, but it's just, a, it's, it's a case by case, but I really think we should have, you know, offer the, the students the opportunity for that. Right. Would, um, I mean, creating these sort of business models, which is really what they are when you get into the later stages, um, you could do that and have special projects in certain cases. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Which might be an alternative. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Leary, I think you had a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, just to piggyback on Mrs. Bowen, and, and please jump in, Mrs. Bowen, if I'm wrong. Are you trying to find out how many teachers are at each grade level? Like, is there four in grade nine and four in grade, in grade 10 and four in grade 11? Or is it four for the whole system for P-TECH? So a P-TECH student, what's he have? He so, has English, math, science, social studies? Correct. In 10th grade gets same thing? Yes. Different teachers, same teachers? Um, so right, right now they're taking, there, there are two teachers. There's a math teacher and an English teacher that they're taking summit with. Some of the students we added um, a science teacher, two science teachers this year that are teaching some of the summit uh, science and some of the uh, traditional method of science. So what's the total number of teachers besides? The we have two, two full-time teachers, one math, one English. And, and, this, year, and this year he's teaching uh, ninth grades 9, 10, and 11 for English. Uh, for math he's teaching uh, algebra 1 and algebra 2. We have a, um, science teachers who are teaching um, one bio and a, and a chem through the platform. Now, but those classes are not just uh, P-TECH students. They're, they're uh, non-P-TECH students who are in those programs as well. So the total teachers is two? No, we have a math teacher. One. Science teacher. Two. I'm sorry, math teacher and English teacher, two. Yep. And we have two uh, science teachers that are teaching part-time. They're full-time teachers, but they teach some classes in the traditional method model, and they teach some in the other, in the, in the summit platform. Learning. What about social studies? None right now. None right now. So this was started with a grant. Am I correct, Mrs.? That is correct, Mr. Leary. And now it's becoming, where the state paid for it, and now it's becoming a responsibility for us to keep picking it up is our responsibility to deliver the curriculum? Yes. And I believe we also have a workplace learning teacher? Yeah, workplace learning, but it's not just P-TECH, it's also NACTEC. Right, tech, right. Uh, well. that's right, it's NACTEC. Yeah. So that is correct, we deliver the curriculum for the program. It does not mean we hire additional teachers, though. If that's where you're going. If we didn't have P-TECH, we wouldn't have this, am I correct? No, they would still be in They would school. still they would be, be a teaching. Rogers teacher. They would just teach English well, in, the in a different how many style. Kids, how many kids are Rogers kids of the 27, 26, and 23, and how many are from out of district? I don't have that memorized on what, on, on, on those, those, I'd have to look that up. So we, we, we base our schedules of Rogers about around P, well, around the Volk Tech Center. We do a lot of things that we that I, I'm deadly just against. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it just I don't know. I mean, everybody goes to CSRI for nothing now. They can all go to CSRI for nothing, and we're doing a program that's costing a lot of money. And 
I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure of the numbers. I mean, is it Newport kids, Milltown kids, Fort Smith kids, what, Tiffany kids? May I ask the question, what is the difference? Well, I mean, if, if we're basing the program on this, it's the cost of, if this is costing us, you know, $500,000 of under program, I'm just making that number up, you know? <laughs> and we're doing this for out of district kids, and we're collecting 6,000 from the company or 7,000 in the coming year. It's something we have to reevaluate at a cost. So it's the CTE program. It's a, it's a CTE program, which is very important to know. It's $7,000 if they're part-time, and it's $14,000 per student if they're full-time, just like any of our other CTE yes, programs. Is correct. that correct? That's correct. Yes. So, again, I'm not going to belabor this with you, okay. but, you know, for, for, if you got 10 kids in that program that are out of district, or 20 kids, or whatever that number is, we're basing our money, if it's all part-time, I'm not saying they're not, you're basing on $70,000, and we're spending... Four or five hundred thousand. No, that's not true, and that's not accurate. And I think it would be good if we had a workshop on this so that the public could better understand it, because I do think that some people start to think that way. Yes, it is. I mean, yes, it is. we should have a workshop. I got no problem with that. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is a discussion on the Niaskin report to. That's another time for the workshop. Is there any other questions of Mr. Young for the, uh, based on the NIAS, Dr. Flowers? I just want to say, looking at the, you know, the regular slide presentation you had, it seems that that evaluation process was quite thorough. And the, the recommendations, quite a few of them seemed <coughs> quite doable. And it was just interesting um, scheduling and a few other things that what's going on at the high school, the, the, the main, high school uh, will affect a lot of that quite positively, you know. And I just think that uh, we talk about how much things cost, and to, to me, I think to everyone else sitting here, the cost of not providing these multiple pathways to our young people will be much more. So we're provided, we're getting creative, and I remember uh, oh, several terms ago when we're talking about kids wanting to drop out and all that. And I said, it is up to us, and I say us as educators, some of us here are, to get something to a hook to get these kids, these young people, to want to be here. And it says a lot about the teachers that some of them don't want to leave their teacher to go out to an internship. But uh, they'll, they'll learn, they'll get it after a while. But it says a lot about <coughs> some of our teachers that they feel that connected so that there is a mentorship of sorts going on. So to that, I say congratulations. Thank you. Um, Anything else, Mrs. Neary? Um, on, the, on what you said, a couple of things I thought were interesting. Well, a lot of things were interesting. But on the follow-up, you said it's really difficult to follow up on the students once they've graduated. Um, do you... I mean, we, have, we struggle with the same thing at Salve, trying to figure out once they've graduated, where they're going and are they working. And um, I mean, I assume you've tried this, but simply figuring out what their personal email addresses yep. are and throwing out surveys. Yep. And you know, of course, they don't answer them um, because they don't. And so actually, to go back to Josephine, um, throwing um, alumni events is what we found to be both surveys and then alumni events to get them back to talk about what they're doing and it gets us better numbers so that's just use the technology yeah we're hoping with, with social media and different technology yeah. that it will get get easier and, you know because we're not doing paper anymore we're just no. it's easier to keep in touch so um, you know we have an act facebook page hopefully like they'll, they'll continue to like yeah. that and, and you know stay yeah. close with us and, and then um my only <clears throat> my only other question for the students in the p-tech program currently mm -hmm. Um, if we were not offering PTEC, do you think they'd still be at Rogers or would they be no. looking for those opportunities somewhere else? I think Middletown would, would take it in about two seconds. Okay. I mean, the PTEC program, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a unique program where we're giving, providing students the opportunity mm -hmm. to get <coughs> employment in a STEM field. Mm -hmm. And if you go anywhere, look at any survey you want to look at, uh, there is a dire need mm -hmm. for people to fill those positions. I mean, these kids are going to leave uh, after their next year. They're going to be seniors. They're going to have some of these kids are only going to need 
three or six more credits to get their associate degree. And they're going to jump, have the opportunity to jump right, right into a job. And there are employers right now that are waiting for these kids. Like they're saying, this, is, this seat right here is yours. Mm -hmm. You just have to finish, and I'm taking you right. here. And so, and these are, you know, $80,000 uh, a year jobs for just having an associate degree. Right. So, you know, you know, we're providing them an opportunity. And they're going to, you know, hopefully they stay on the aisle. And hopefully they, you know, continue to, to give back That's to awesome. here. So, um, right. you know, I just think it's a it's an opportunity that that uh, you know we're lucky to have, um, and mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know, right. I think the benefits. I mean, we're still in it young. We're only in year three, so uh, we haven't really got them out into the workplace yet. But um, you know, the relationships we have with the employers, with you know, with the War College and the Navy base, that's growing, and so now they're seeing more, you know, more of what's going on here at the school. And just quick, quick, I think maybe it's for the superintendent. If those students who are currently in our program here decided to leave, they're still our students. We would have to pay out to whatever district they go to, correct? No. If they're PTEC no, students. If they're Newport residents. If they were Newport, would. that's what I mean. If they yes. were Newport yeah. resident kids right. in the program. Yes, we would pay and tuition. And we would have to pay tuition to wherever they, they OK. Yes. Just, right. And that's, and that's growing. So, so Middletown has an engineering program now. And so we're sending tuition to Middletown. Portsmouth has, you know, some programs. We're sending, yeah. um, you know, students to there. So um, you know, we've, we've got a program that, that you know, a lot of out-of-district students, I, I think today, uh, we just took a quick look, but I, I want to say five or six, um, you know, incoming freshmen from Tiverton are, are all, you know, PTEC. We have a lot of PTEC applications, um, you know, for this year coming up. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Young on his presentation? All right, thank you, Mr. Young. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Young, and thank you for the event this evening at Rogers. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is item 7.2, a staffing update from Dr. Germain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In front of you tonight, you have um, an update on the staffing for this year. I will share with you that we are coordinating three ways and will be finished tomorrow, hopefully, in updating actually the Lawson system so that the city and um, the school department will have three different uh, coordinated databases. Mr. Dr. Cauley's uh, own master sheet, our HR, which is something the city has always wanted us to have. They've been working on that diligently. And, this, and we are now working on updating the Lawson system. So tomorrow afternoon, we're hoping to notify the city and Director Citrin that that will be done. So that's where we are right now. Any questions for Dr. Jermaine on the staffing uh, summary that is before you this evening? Mr. Mr. Leary. Mr. Chairman, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't get a paper notified. Could you, Ms. Mrs. Uh, Jermaine, do we have more staff this year than last year or not? If you look at the total I, that sorry, HR. Yeah. I'm sorry if, to have it. Go ahead. No. Well, if I'm looking, and yeah. I apologize, no, I can my glasses is broke, so I'm Go trying <laughs> with two different pairs of glasses to read the charts tonight. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you look at the totals right now, last year, and for the public, it's called full-time equivalents. We measure employees by the amount of hours they put in, they work in the system. Right now, uh, last year we had 388.4, and you'll notice um, as of 2-12-2019, we have 386.3, so we're actually down by two. I will tell you in one particular area we're focused on is paraeducators. And paraeducators are something we really need in our classrooms, but it is something we're looking at because for two, every two paraeducators you have, you can probably hire a certified teacher. So those are some of the things we're looking at as far as how we're providing educational services to our students and if we're providing the best opportunities for our staff and our students. So we're in the middle of that right now. So um, in relation to teachers, what's the numbers on teachers? I'm sorry? What's the numbers on teachers for last year and this year? The teachers, all right. Um, give me a moment, please. T-CERT, is that certified? T-CERT, yeah, right over here. 220. Thank you. Um, last year, they're the first two columns. 
Uh, last year it was 79.1. This is Powell. No, that's Powell. Go to the right-hand side. Totals are all the way to the right. No, it's oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 219. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. For our teachers? Yeah. 219. 219.1. Last year and 220.20. And 220.20. So I'm, I'm a good ad for an, an eye doctor right now. All right. Thank you. This was as of two. Any other questions 12. for Dr. Jermaine on the summary? Okay. Chair, okay. how will the report be received? Becky, do you have? No. Ms. Ms. Boland's looking at another sheet that says 223 and 224, I believe. Yes. All right. Ms. Clark went into HR and she did some adjustments. She did. Okay, yes. So it's been Yes, you're right. The last time we were at a finance subcommittee meeting. So this sheet is not correct that we got with the agenda. The latest. This is of the long term. Miss Bolin, do you have the one from the finance subcommittee? Not with me right now. Yeah. Is this the one you have right now from tonight's update? Yes. Then I don't have the correct one in my binder. There was an adjustment made. Yes. Is it? So, excuse me, I'm confused. Is the one from the Finance Committee correct, or is this one correct? It's the one Ms. Clark put in the update. And my binder, obviously, hasn't been updated, and I didn't look in my, I don't have my laptop open. So, so we're so looking at 7.2. I don't know what Mrs. Bowling is looking at. I'm looking at 7.2. I just, I said three, I would yeah. come in your office tomorrow. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Right. May I ask the rest of the committee? Does the rest of the committee have that same sheet? We have, yeah. we have the 7.2 with 219. 7.2, 212, 2019 has a date on it. Yeah, correct. Yeah. January 12th. Yeah. All right. Yeah, okay. Ms. Poland, what do you That's have? That's the updated one. I just, I, I'll just take this. So, so just for clarification purposes, yeah. you're saying that there were some adjustments made since the Finance Review Committee I, meeting. I believe there were, and that's what Ms. Clark and HR is working this. on now. Okay, yes. so that's what we're trying to right. So could we get a Thank you. new one in March? Yes. You'll probably get the new one next week. Yeah. And then okay. Yes. Yes. Any other questions on the staffing summary? Okay, no. great. Uh, next item up is 7.3, attendance and discussion of the C tree report. Uh, Mr. Leary, Dr. Jermaine, Mr. Leary, I'm not sure you requested it. So I'm not right, sure. and, uh, and Mr. Leary's pointing at, we have with us this evening the um, chairperson of the C tree um, initiative, um, Dr. Robert Archer, executive vice president uh, of Child and Family Services. He's with us today. And he's been here all the way from the beginning before me. Is that right? Fine with me. As long as we can hear him. There you go. Uh, good evening. Um, I, so I'm not sure what you're looking for exactly tonight. I'm here to uh, answer any questions yeah. you might have. I can give you a little bit of history in terms of uh, how this came about, uh, if that will help kind of kick off the conversation. Uh, as Dr. Germain said, um, uh, I've uh, been involved with the Chronic Early Absenteeism Project since we started. So you might be familiar with the Newport Partnership for Families, uh, which is a, a Newport, uh, well, really Newport County uh, partnership of agencies and entities that work together to uh, look at services and concerns in the community and. Uh, work together. Five years ago, that group got together and said, we're going to look at core issues that we want to focus on. Uh, and given the annual data that we receive from Kids Count uh, each year, uh, looking at Newport and looking at some of the needs in Newport, um, the Newport Partnership for Families a uh, number of agencies with the school decided to take a closer look at chronic absenteeism. So obviously um, uh, not a simple problem, but we felt that uh, it, it uh, given the fact that Newport, uh, like some of the other uh, communities in Rhode Island, had some pretty significant uh, attendance issues that we wanted to spend some time and effort looking at that. And so the first year we really gathered um, 
a number of folks uh, from the community around the table, a good number of people, uh, agencies, schools, police, uh, community members, and uh, uh, a consultant, and really tried to determine, hey, what's the, what's the depth and breadth of the need, and what's best practices, what's happening across the country, and anyway, so we, we took a year to really try to design uh, an approach, uh, approached the Van Buren Charitable Trust, uh, asked them to support us in an effort to begin to plant some seeds around uh, this issue and, and to strengthen kind of a, uh, well, not kind of, to strengthen a community approach. So that's what we did. Um, and so the report in front of you is really looking at that partnership. I believe you have the report, right? Yeah. yeah. So that, that report that you have is, is kind of looking back over f after that first year, uh, fast forward to where we are uh, today, that report is really reflecting on what happened with that partnership, what kinds of things worked, what kind of things didn't work, uh, what are we going to do moving forward? Um, from uh, my perspective, uh, as uh, chairing that work group and chairing that committee and working in collaboration with the, with the schools and with uh, the other partner agencies uh, and reviewing the, the report myself, um, you can see that there's a ton of work that went into this over the, over the past several years. Um, um, so, um, that included, uh, you know, mostly by people, by the way, who are, uh, you know, doing a lot of other things. They're, they have other full-time jobs, including myself. So, uh, but, you know, really what it was is a, a collaboration. And, and uh, so we um, spent a lot of time trying to figure out um, where we could uh, have the most impact um, and what kinds of practices might stimulate um, greater attachment to schools by kids and families, uh, increased attendance uh, uh, by kids, and you know, greater enga engagement with uh, parents and children. So um, why don't I pause there, and uh, I don't know if you want me to sort of keep talking or if you want to ask any questions. I think we have some questions. Mr. Leary. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, thank you very much for coming and waiting all this time. I appreciate that very much. My pleasure. Um, I have some real concerns here. Not, not as much report. How many years has this report's been going on? Two years, three years now? How, how long has this effort been going yeah, on? Yeah, two or three years. Uh, well, we were funded for four years, but uh, it's been going on for five years. And it, the grant's about 250, 300,000? Um, 200 50, a little more. We also got some money from Rhode Island Foundation to support this, a small amount of money. So, but yes, over three, over the first three years, and then we got refunded by Van Buren uh, for another three years. And we're in the first, we're just finishing the first year of that funding. So, um, I know we've had conversations about this personally, you and I, <laughs> I have some real concerns here. And I don't know what we can do. I mean, if you take the Pro Joe article on um, Ride that comes out, and I showed I showed you that about a week back, Bob. You know, um, there's 230 schools in Rhode Island, and that changes weekly. I don't know how they do that, but you look at it, it changes. Like, Rogers is 229 on absenteeism, 229 out of 230 schools. Thompson's 184, Pell's 176. These, these, this is trying numbers. If you go to the weekly reports we get in our thing, and this is not, I'm not blaming anybody, Bob, but it's just yeah. my nature. You know, in the week that we had to write in January, the week of January, the month of January, I'm sorry, the month of January, if I could speak. Um, the month of January, in the one week less, guess how many kids were at, Mrs. Mrs. Jermaine always corrects me, she's right. It's, guess how many incidents of absenteeism we had for three weeks of school in January, 2,883 2, at Rogers, 1,523 at Thompson, and 2,212 instance of tardy and absenteeism for January. We can't get our test results up. We get a one in absenteeism, our score is the lowest number you can get. 
And, and I said this to Rob, and he had a very good answer to me when we met the other day. I, I think we're at a point, at least I do, and again, I'm always a one on a vote in the committee, so I get used to that. Um, I think we're at a point now that, I, I, and Bob made a very good point, I'll give him Rob made a very good point, um, that if you look at Paraguay, and I don't pronounce that wrong, how do I pronounce that, Mrs. Bowen? The country? Paraguay? Pa Paraguay. Paraguay. Okay, Paraguay, thank you. Paraguay, they hired a person to come in there to eliminate, and Rob's answer is very good. I'll get to your, I'll get to your answer, Rob. Just for the record, it was, it was at Tickets Bar and Grill that we met, so <laughs> it wasn't like we had a secret meeting somewhere, but. <laughs> a restaurant. <laughs> so so um, they, they hired this person to come in there to eliminate, to eliminate the, um, the mosquito problem with malaria. And everybody around it, where Paraguay is, all, all around them has malaria problems. This guy said, the first thing I want to do, scrap everything we're doing. Everything you're doing, eliminate everything. And he said, we're starting over. And now, if you Google them and Google Paraguay's number, it's gone. And I think we're at that point. Rob made a very good point. I'm going to give him credit. He said, that's a medical thing. And you're dealing with a social thing here. And you're absolutely yeah, right. Mosquitoes. You're 100% you're yeah, right in that, Rob, you know? But I know, but this, this, this guy 100% eliminated malaria from that country. All around him, there's malaria because he scrapped it. And I think we're at this point now when for the last four years, 10 years, I mean, there's over 50,000 absence, sorry, Mrs. Gain, sorry, Mrs. Mrs. 50,000 incidents of absentees and tidium every year. For the, I started looking at this when I was on the committee three or four years ago, 50. Thousand. Think about that number with 2,100, 2,200 kids. It's insane. And that's why we got a one, and that's why we're getting two on our test results. You, in all these years of 38 years of teaching school, they're not in the seats, you're not getting the job done. You're getting results. So I'm sorry I've talked too long. It's not using my nature, but I'll, thank you, Mr. Gomes. Yeah. Mrs. Boatwright. Um, I, I, I'm looking through your report, and this is really the first year that the young voices have been part of the initiative and so on. Would you speak to the fact that, that they've been able to bring in some new information and so on, and maybe how that might change things? Sure. Um, yes, the, the young voices we introduced uh, to, the, to, the, to Rogers last year, um, uh, the last school year, and they're here this year as well. Um, uh, with that? Yeah, uh, right. And, and um, one of the things that came out of one of our meetings this year, at the beginning of the school year, uh, it's really important that people understand that when we meet, it's not just a couple of people sitting around a table making stuff up as we go, that we, we sit as a group and, and try to make uh, uh, good, informed decisions. And so the schools said, look, we like what Young Voices are doing at Rogers. We want to do the same thing at Thompson. So we're trying to introduce, we are introducing Young Voices uh, at Thompson as well. But the Young Voices is an effort. Uh, you had a young woman uh, sitting here at your table uh, participating in your meeting tonight, and you heard that the kind of fresh perspective that she brought. Young Voices is a way of engaging young people to look and talk and, and, and engage around difficult uh, policy kinds of issues and participate in it. And what the Young Voices folks did was, um, and do, is look at some of the issues uh, around school climate, school culture. Uh, they look at the, uh, the RIDE data, the Rhode Island Department of Education data, and they kind of use that data to drive their uh, efforts here in Newport, and they, you know, ask questions, get kids together, do surveys, uh, engage as a group, meet on a weekly basis, and, you know, really try to bring a student perspective to this problem uh, and, and try to understand what kinds of changes from a culture and climate perspective do students see as uh, ways to improve. And so, when they present their data and their information, it's pretty compelling. Uh, and it's not about, well, I'll tell you, I, you know, I don't have it in front of me, but what it's about is, what they see is, is that um, for the most part, young people want to be in school. For the most part, young people want to be engaged. For, for the most part, young people want to be challenged. Uh, they want to be, um, they want to, they want to be part of the educational system. And so uh, 
sometimes we do a good job with that and sometimes we don't. And they make recommendations about how we might, you know, be more uh, culturally competent, uh, make recommendations about how we might change curriculum so that it would engage kids more. Uh, you know, a lot of what they talked about is a, really wanting adults to, uh, to engage them, wanting adults to speak with them, wanting adults to reach out to them. And so, you know, and we found with our, uh, the surveys that we did, and our evaluator did surveys with teachers, surveys with students, uh, focus groups, and really um, a lot of what we, we find over and over again, it's, it's about how do we create a place where kids and parents feel welcome and engaged. Um, so the, the Young Voices is extremely refreshing. It's like it's, I said, it's been a year. Uh, we want to expand it into Thompson, and that's happening. Uh, I think there are other things we can do with the Young Voices to, to uh, help, you know, um, students, you know, young people can help us, um, and we need to help them. But, but, but the adults and the kids can, can definitely, uh, I think, create a climate, improve the culture in our, our, our buildings so that, you know, we have, we have a greater impact. And, you know, to, to Mr. Leary's point, you know, it might seem like three years or four years is a long time for this kind of a problem, but it's not. And, and by the way, the reason we're, we're doing this is exactly what you said, Bobby. It's because exactly for the reasons that you're talking about. If it was a small problem, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be trying to tackle it. It is a big problem. You know, we have struggled to move the needle in terms of attendance over the last few years, but we've got a bunch of adults and young people in a room together talking about it all the time. We've got community members, we've got school people, we've got school leadership, we've got the superintendent there. We've got other, you know, Boys and Girls Club, Child and Family. You know, people who are, we're talking about it. And that might, that's not enough. But, but the topic of school attendance and engagement and culture and climate is a, is, a, is a conversation that's happening all the time. And I got to hope that that's, that's a good a step in the right direction. Mrs. Bowling. Yeah. But the bottom line is nothing has improved in the last three, I mean, like, other than Thompson. And I will say what Thompson's doing is they make phone calls home. And I, I know that's correct. You know, and, and it, it's, and it's working. So, you know, I don't understand, like, when you do something over and over again, and I, it's great that all these people are involved, and I saw too that you were losing some of your enthusiasm in the last year from like some of the, you weren't getting the same support that you felt like you needed at some of the schools. I read that in the report. Well, what the report said was that as a partnership, because that evaluation was evaluating for the most part, how are we doing collectively as, a, as an entity, as doing collective impact, and what it said is, you know, this past year, some decisions were getting made and, you know, kind of one-off kind of basis. The partnership was struggling to kind of remain as cohesive. I think that's probably true to a certain extent. Um, but, you know, um, so, so at some that's point, okay. I wonder, like, but I mean, I, I, the other thing I would say, I would say is I, I don't think we've continued to do the same thing over and over again. I think if you look at the report, what, what it will show you is we've kept to trying different things and kind of trying to, you know, uh, uh, you know, add money for mentoring, add money for attendance facilitators, pull money back from mentoring because the mentoring program didn't work. Um, you know, add money for Young Voices for Thompson because that was a successful thing. So, but go ahead. So, what, so what, I mean, my point being though that, you know, like it comes back to, oh, the teachers have to make more interesting classes or we have to entertain them more or, you know, it, it sometimes it's about, I hate to say this, but, you know, like, you make, make it so they want to come to school because there's a punitive, you know, like there's a consequence to not showing up, whether it's to the parents or the kids. And I just, I just wonder, you know, at what point we hold kids responsible for showing up to school and, I, and not about being entertained and everything else. So I'm just, yeah, that's I, just I think that, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't think anybody, um, you know, what we know, uh, and this isn't, this isn't, uh, um, I don't have, uh, all the answers here. We do have a component of this project that involves truancy court. 
We do have people in truancy court every week. We have people going out to homes, meeting with parents, trying to address this. We're not just patting people on the back saying, hey, you know, it would be really nice for you to be in school. When it's, when it's appropriate and possible, we try to use uh, leverage. Um, but we could fill truancy court every week with uh, hundreds of kids if we wanted to, if we wanted to take only a, a punitive approach and it wouldn't work. You know, the, the, um, that's a, that has limited utility when it comes to getting kids to come to school. Can I ask, um, I have a whole bunch of questions. Um, my first one though is fundamentally, because the thing I did not see in the report, and I know it's gonna sound crass, but I didn't see numbers, by which I mean we have um, here's the number of truancies and absences and instances of absences we have this year. There's a number for that. I didn't see a goal saying that at the end of this academic year, we'd like to get it to this place, and at the get end of the next academic year, we'd like to get it to another. I think sometimes we need the number, and we need the number as the goal, looking out there and going, okay, we have if Mr. Lee is correct, we have 50,000 instances of truancies um, and absences. At the end of this academic year, we would like it to get it to 40,000, right? We're, we're not trying to solve all of it this year, but there has to be a way to benchmark where we're going, and I'm not seeing that in here. I'm seeing, you're right, I'm seeing lots of, um, lots of different ways of trying lots of different strategies, but I need, I, honestly, I need a benchmark. I need like, here's where we're trying to get so that by the end of the year, we can go, okay, we met this, we didn't meet this. So I'd like to see that personally. So that, that was one thing. The other thing I saw a lot um, in the big barriers, number one, after illnesses, was school's boring. School's boring, that was, that's, for Rogers and for Thompson, after physical illnesses, school is boring. So, and then yeah, for high school there was transportation issues and we can address those, but school is boring, that's a fundamental issue. And no amount of mentoring, taking them to the Boys and Girls Club, no amount of any of those things is going to change the fact that school is boring. So I'd like to see some suggestions as to essentially how to make, not, how to, make school not boring. And again, if it was five kids missing, we wouldn't be talking about it. But it is a lot of kids, and we do have a one on the right report. So school is boring, how do we address that? You know, those are the conversations I like to see happen. How do we address school is boring? Uh, you know, you can't address physical illness. We can try, certainly, if I'm, I'm the 17 year old in charge of my little sister, we can try to help in social aspects, but both for Rogers and for Thompson, that is quite literally what you wrote. After well, physical yeah. illnesses, school is boring. The, the report was written by... Uh, I mean, not you personally. Uh, yeah, 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 no, but it's important because I think you're right about the, 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 the numbers. Um, this, you know, part of this project, I know somebody, I, I'm not in charge here, but if yeah, somebody else wants to ask a question out there. But the... the um, Part of the project, you know, there was only, we had to pick and choose what we could do in terms of the evaluation, and the evaluator uh, evaluated how are we doing as a partnership because the belief was that the better we do as a, 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 as a, as a collaborative and as a collective impact kind of a group, the better, the better our impact is going to be. But you're right. Now, I will say this, that the data, the first thing we did with this project the uh, first thing the superintendent did with this project was say, when she got here, was to say, we need to get accurate data. So we need to be collecting data consistently across the schools. We need to determine what's an excuse absent, what's not. We need to determine when are we counting kids absent, when are we counting kids tardy, when are we taking attendance? Are we doing it at the beginning of the day, and the end of the day, the middle of the day? So we really had to get our data uh, definitions correct. And now what we do, and what the superintendent does more than I do, because I'm, I'm, you know, my full-time job is doing some other things, but is look at data every single day. So we do know exactly where we are and where, what progress we are or are not making. And we look at it at the end of every year, which is why, you know, we're sitting here. 
Uh, so, but you're right. I do think that we need to probably another step would be to say wh what what are our targets? Where are we trying to get to? And you know, uh, what what constant? We have kids who are chronically absent, meaning they have more than 10 percent of days out of school uh, a year or at any given point in time, who are going to pass and do fine. It doesn't mean they don't need to be in school. But that's different than the kid who is chronically absent and is, and is, and is failing and falling behind. And so even that sort of, de you know, slicing and dicing the data that way would be, would be ideal. We're, we're not uh, right. I mean, I, necessarily there yet. Benchmarks are important because they drive us to the thing we want to get to. Um, so Agreed. looking at the data at the end of each year is great, and we should do that, and we should have accurate data, and we should, but it's different than having a number that drives us on the wall like they have here. They have this, it's a nice banner and it says, you know, be the nice kid, that's the goal, yeah. right? So, um, you know, get down to 40,000 or 30,000, that's the goal and put all your efforts in, in that. On some level, we're not, we can't solve every problem. We cannot solve every problem for the children who are chronically absent. But I go back to after illness, school is boring. You know, so mentoring is great and all those things are great. But if the if the student does not want does not want to walk into school, no amount of phone calls is going to get that child into a classroom. I mean they might show up. They may. Well yeah, I think but they also may show up and do nothing. I mean we're also in the in the goal in, we're also in the business of educating them. It's not jail. I mean, you're not, we can call you and get you to school and you can sit there and do nothing all day. So we've gotten the number down, but we haven't educated you because you choose not to. Essentially, you're like, not interested. I'll sit there and take a space. So I just, it was, it was really disheartening reading this. Like, because I'm new on the committee, it was, it was disheartening reading it and, and not seeing benchmarks and not seeing, okay, what are we trying to get to and the right data, which was, not good on absenteeism for our students, but it also wasn't good for our teachers. So those two things, I think, go together because there were some issues in there, certainly at the middle school. Middle school is just middle school. It's like, I don't want to see this teacher or I'm not happy. It, middle school, they're just it's difficult. But um, yeah, mostly my comment is I'd like to see some benchmarks and I, what do we do about school is boring? You know, and I don't know that I'm not asking you to find a solution, but I think for oh, us, all of, he, all of us here is like, what do we do about that second, um, you know, we can, we can possibly fix transportation, right? We can possibly fix socially, I'm the caregiver for my younger siblings, but school is boring and this is what we do. We do the school part. So I, I would like as a group for us to think about how how do we fix that? I understand scheduling changes maybe help those things, but it's just jarring. School's boring, so I'm not coming. So it's jarring. Mm -hmm. Dr. Flowers. Yeah, I'm looking at, I've been going through the report here and a few things are popping out. 48 times the word parents came up in this report. I didn't count them, it came up when I said fine parents. No, I'm not. I'm not that much. I'm not that obsessive. No, but it's just interesting to look at some of the. They call the the different tier barriers at Pell and the ones at Thompson and the ones at Rogers. Barriers for the young people coming to school, and they're rather discreet. Uh, just quite different, and that's one thing to consider. Another seems to be a communications problem. Uh, many. Uh, teachers, uh, personnel in the schools are uh, you know, getting on that phone and contacting and say, hey, you know, your child didn't come in today. Sometimes it's sincerely because of illness. Please, if they're not feeling well, they should stay home. But they said even the percentage of teachers who said that they right away they contact parents or speak to them early in the year, it's gone up a bit, but it's not in my estimation, as high as it should be. I'm just speaking as someone who was in that particular field. Also, when you, you're mentioning about school is boring, 
I'm just wondering, and I'm not, I don't think I can get an answer right now, but when, as with a lot of surveys, in, in order to try to simplify things, if you say, hey, could you please check off all the reasons why, it could be anything, why you don't come to school, you check off all these different things. But if you ask someone for an open-ended answer, what, what, can you give me one or two reasons why you are not in school as often as you should be, then maybe you can get some true answers. Because if you look at it and you say, oh yeah, may maybe I am bored. I'm just thinking. Sometimes I, people will answer. I, I asked this several terms ago when someone was giving a presentation. I said, is there a, um, a margin of error in these surveys? Well, yeah, there really is. Are some people answering what they think you want to hear or what they really feel. So I'm just throwing some of this out. I don't know. I'm looking at a lot of this and I suppose the responsibility can be spread around to all of us. My thoughts. Let's Jennifer, if you'd like, you just need to go to the podium. You can ask a question, just identify yourself and you're more than welcome to ask a question. I'm Jennifer, I just had a quick question. Um, so if a student from Rogers High School misses their bus, is there some sort of something they can do to get a ride to school if their parents don't have transportation? Is there someone they can call? Do they call Eddie Merritt? Do they call, do the kids know that? Yes, the students can, most of the students, especially those that do miss quite a bit, they can call the student attendance officer. He actually has given his cell phone number to them and he will pick them up. Yeah. Um, so he does do that. We don't, I don't know if every child does that or if every child knows that. When they're starting to monitor students that have been out and when they make the phone calls, et cetera, we have a list of students immediately we go to and the issues sometimes are so personal and individual that the guidance counselors at I'll just speak for the middle school and high school, are really, and even at the elementary school with our student, um, our student assistance uh, personnel, they're really clear and they, they know the families that need assistance as far as rides, et cetera. So we try to make sure we do that here. Mr. Uh, McKenna goes out and he picks up students. Eddie, uh, Mr. Merritt will be called mostly from high school students and sometimes from the middle school parents. Mr. Kahini at uh, Thompson is often um, praised for his, he has a very organized system. And at the high school, they've tried to replicate that. And um, we've had internal discussions with the uh, Sea Tree group and the foundation is willing, we posted a stipend position, I think, recently to have someone help monitor this with all three schools and to have a point person. That's one of the things we've noticed as far as an organizational, something different to do than what we have been doing in the past. I asked this question because I, I had a student that came with me to an event over the weekend to volunteer and she was very organized. She contacted me, was I on my way to pick her up? Was she, she was on the ball, but she had missed school that day on Friday. And um, it was interesting because I was like, well, why'd you miss school? And she said, I missed the bus. And she's like, I feel really guilty that I missed school. Like she wanted to be at school. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting. She didn't obviously know. And I told her I thought there was somebody and I kind of thought it might be Eddie, but I don't think all the kids know. And maybe these kids that aren't chronically absent should know because she contributed to that 50,000, even though she told me she feels anxious and guilty when she doesn't make it to school. Okay. Um, so. I don't know, I just had those questions because I feel like I don't know all the kids, but I do when I get to, I, I don't have kids myself, I, I'm not a teacher, but I do sometimes get to know the kids on a personal level on occasion. A teacher actually had reached out to me and asked me to talk with this girl because she didn't seem very engaged in school, and but she was interested in fashion and blah, blah, blah. But interestingly enough, I didn't find her to not be engaged, but the teacher didn't know that. This kid's taken right. a three night a week CNA class to get her CNAs license and she's only a junior. Um, she's very worried about her future. We had a long discussion about what she wanted to do and she was constantly worrying and anxious about her future. So this kid wants to be at school, but she didn't know that there was 
something she could do to get a ride to school. And her mom doesn't have a car because I spoke to her mom on the phone and her mom said, I don't have a ride, but she can go. And, you know, it was kind of an interesting scenario. So I don't think she's the only kid that's in that situation. Thank you. I'll follow up with the high school on that one. Thank you, Jennifer. Any other discussion? Okay, see you Thank you. Thanks for your time tonight. Hey, Rob, I owe you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> What's that? I owe you. Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you. I know it's easier when you're sitting down being a target when you're standing up. <laughs> Next item is the consent agenda. 8.1 is approval of minutes. Motions in order to approve the minutes so as moved. presented. Second. Uh, made by uh, Dr. Flowers, second by Mrs. Sylvia. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. 8.2 is the personnel actions. And I believe on uh, personnel actions, we are going to ask for A1 to be pulled until our March meeting. Um, it'll be pulled to this question for the finance director that will have answered for the March 12th meeting. Uh, so a motion would be in order to pull A1 from the consent or from the personnel actions. 8.2 A. 8.1. A1. Category A appointments, position one. It's A2A, isn't it? A2A. A1. I have A.1. It's A1. Do you have the right meeting up, Becky? This is the second time. Yeah, so under, under that, that would be A1. It's the appointment is being pulled. We need a motion for that, please. Is there a motion to pull 8.1 until our March meeting? So moved. Second. Made by Mr. Leary, seconded by Dr. Flowers. Any other discussion on the personnel? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 8.3 is request for approval of invoices and requisitions. I believe we are going to pull that until the March 12th meeting as well uh, for questions for Dr. Colley. And 8.4, 8.4 is request for approval of home instruction. Is there a motion to approve the home instruction? Motion to approve home instruction. Uh, made by Mrs. Neary, is there a second? Second. Dr. Flowers, uh, any discussion on that motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 9.1 is our monthly correspondence. And I do not have any, so I don't believe there's any correspondence. Mm -hmm. 10 is uh, superintendent reports. 10.1 would be expenditure and revenue report. Um, I know Dr. Right? Mr. Chair would like to pull the first okay. two reports. 10.1, 10.2 will be pulled until uh, for March 12th meeting. 10.3 is enrollment demographics. Mr. Uh, Chair? Yes. I move that 10.3, and 0.5 be approved or accepted. Be accepted as reported. Is there a second on that motion to Mrs. Second. Sylvia? Yeah. Seconded by Dr. Flowers. Any discussion? Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, number 11 is into meeting dates and agenda. Bear with me for a moment to catch up. Some of these may be from before the cancellation tonight, tonight. February 22nd, there's a wellness subcommittee meeting, 9.30 uh, a.m. in NACTEC room 900. No, no, that time has been changed, Mr. Chair, recently to 11 a.m. 11 a.m. Okay. 11 a.m. Uh, February 25th, Newport School Committee special meeting, 5 p.m. Pell Elementary School Conference Room. February 25th is a Newport School Committee meeting with the legislators here at Pell School at 6 p.m. in the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. February 26th is a building school building subcommittee, 5.30 in Act Tech Room 900. March 5th, Newport School Committee, Newport City Council joint meeting on Studio J presentation of the district analysis uh, moving forward towards a letter of intent uh, and stage one application. March 6th is a Newport School Committee special meeting, 5 p.m. NAC, NAC Tech Room 926. 
And uh, as far as the gender items, Mr. Leary requested that we uh, do a workshop on, we will make sure that that happens, a workshop on the finances. I have a note here, finances, finances. yes. Fine. On the, um, I'm sorry. Uh, NAC tech finance. NAC tech enrollment Correct. and finance. Right. Correct. Uh, that is all for 11. Uh, we have no executive session, so a motion would be Mr. in order Chair, for adjourn. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I'd like to thank Marson for being here this evening, oh, and yes. I'd also like to wish him a happy birthday oh, on his birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Marson. Happy birthday to you. Thank you so much for filling in this evening. Uh, so there is a motion to adjourn by Mrs. Sylvia, seconded, seconded. by Mrs. Boatwright. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion adjourned. Uh, meeting adjourned. <laughs> Motion is adjourned. Motion is adjourned. Everything is adjourned. <laughs>